your willingness of the price. Uh, thank you. Sorry, I'm already the, going. No, that's okay. Uh, uh, this problem has a major effect on the ability or willingness of the private sector to build affordable housing. Uh, life is too short to put up with this. Uh, the problem, though, is not zoning or land use regulation per se, but the process the current ordinances establish, namely citizen input at a destructive rather than a constructive point in the project's life. The solution to my mind, and keep in mind that I'm, I'm oversimplifying here, is to establish a set of standards and principles that if met, guarantee that developers can proceed with their projects. These include principles about appropriate locations, relationship to the scale of surroundings, transportation issues and street capacity, transitions to adjacent land uses and densities and so forth. This makes the process far more predictable to everyone and reasonable sets of guiding principles actually can be negotiated. People who are against projects don't always win in these public wrestling matches. Some cities, notably Minneapolis, are actually requiring a set aside of affordable units and subdivisions and multifamily projects in their zoning regulations. It remains to be seen how effective these are going to be. Um, they might turn out well, but I think more effective in multifamily projects where units are indistinguishable from each other. I prefer to do uh, the, the one thing land use regulations can actually contribute, reforming the process to increase predictability and to do what I see as fundamental requirement for developing diverse housing types for diverse uh, marketing, thereby reducing risks. So, so in, in, in a certain sense, uh, the, the issue becomes in a, in, in a way too much involvement or at least involvement at the wrong point of a process. That is involvement where, where projects can be destroyed or blown up rather than uh, agreement and consensus um, over the, the appropriate settings for higher density or, or, or affordable developments. And, 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 and so as a result, developers and builders who tend to be risk adversive and, and, and risk is a, is a really critical element here that I'll get back to in a second, um, is, is that, that, that we engender through the process rather than through the regulations, a, a high degree of uncertainty, a high degree of unpredictability when a developer tries to do something different or tries to, um, tr tries to relate to, um, to, to a broader uh, sector of, of the market. And so Euclidean zoning or traditional zoning is leading us to homogeneity, not so much because it prohibits certain types of development, but because uh, the process increases the risk of, 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 of that kind of, of work. And so if we can establish consensus, and I think TOD regulations tend to do this, but are limited to specific areas over where um, affordability and densities are, are appropriate and supported um, and, and establish those standards and areas at the front end and then make the approval process relatively automatic. We're, 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 doing, um, we're doing a much better thing in terms of zoning reform than, um, than, than, than the process that, that a lot of places have gone to to prohibit single family only zoning. Um, not to mention the fact that I would probably expand the scope of that diagram to include small lots, single family, uh, and, and not to say single family detached is per se evil, but rather that, um, that uh, there are projects that, um, that, that, that can be effective with small lots um, that, that really meet the needs of contemporary families very, um, very, very well. Um, a couple of other things to consider before we, we stop the monologue and get into, um, into discussion and Q&A is, um, is that risk is a really big element of, uh, of, the, um, of, of resistance or, or, or an inability to build uh, so-called missing middle housing. And to, to think about this in a lot of the markets that we work in, which include rural and small city as well as, as urban markets, 
housing and, and particularly ownership housing operates contrary to the way that normal capital markets work. Um, in a normal capital market, the, the greater risk produces the greater re reward, greater profit. In housing markets, the greatest risk produces the least reward. So if I'm building um, a $2 million house for uh, a banker in a small town that's a custom built house, my risk is zero and my reward, my markup is going to be great. On the other hand, if I build uh, 10 houses speculatively that are worth $200,000 a piece or, or 10 units that are worth $200,000 a piece, my risk is very large because I don't know who those buyers are. And, and my exposure is very high and my, my markup or margin on those individual units is going to be very small. So, so the, the, the nature of, of, of markets in, in, in a lot of ways works against uh, accomplishing the kind of development that, that, that we really do need. And that is affordable development for, for families that in some cases may entail building units that people are not necessarily comfortable with building. So in a lot of ways, the most effective types of programs reduce or not altogether eliminate that risk, but reduce that, that, that risk. Um, SIDs in the Omaha metropolitan area have been extremely effective at building housing because they eliminate one aspect of the risk that a developer normally faces, and that is shouldering the cost of providing infrastructure. And so, uh, so ironically, uh, development within the city, which doesn't have uh, access to that kind of risk reduction, gets discouraged. And in the Omaha metro area, the financing system, which does reduce risk to developers in suburban areas, has tended to produce over the decades uh, extensive development uh, in the western parts of the city outside of city limits and provided an incentive to build there over an incentive to build in the city. Um, so, so in a sense, for those of us who are interested in in-city development, we've tended to create a structural component that um, discourages what we want to see. Um, and, and to some degree, that's, that, that incentive still exists, that, uh, that, that because uh, developers can put suburban development on the charge card, uh, as it were, uh, or by the sale of geo bonds, um, that is not a, an incentive that's available to in-city developers. Uh, there's still that incentive there. To a significant degree, TIF has helped with that um, equalization of, of risk abatement. But, uh, but there are costs to, build, to using TIF, including the designation of areas as blighted. So, um, so, so it, it's, it's still, it, 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 there's, there, there's still some favoritism given to suburban development. The main, the main point that I'm trying to make here is that, is that a, a focus on, on zoning or, uh, or demonization of single family zoning doesn't necessarily produce affordable housing. It doesn't necessarily produce um, missing middle housing if, if your sole definition of that is going to be density. Um, there, the, the, the problem gets to be deeper and gets into economics, gets into uh, incentives, gets into risk abatement, and, um, and, 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 and gets into things that really inhibit affordability. So I think with that, hopefully that will lead to some questions or some or, or some or, or some discussion, and uh, and I look forward to that. Yeah, I really appreciate all of these thoughts, Marty. And I think the way that you illustrate um, the types of housing that we build in our city is a function of different levers and um, you know pulleys that we're pulling in, in different directions right. is, is really effective. Um, I also yeah appreciate you saying that zoning isn't the silver bullet that's going to create affordable housing in Omaha. Um, I'm really interested. You you mentioned um, you know citing Minneapolis as a city that's uh, um, you know removed um, single family zoning um, and here mentioned the example of TOD regulations helping to demonstrate consensus. When you think about um, and I'm really diving into the meat here, I feel like. But when you think about um, other examples of 
um, program directions, uh, policies that we can put in place to help demonstrate consensus besides TOD? What are, what are some of the ones that come to mind? Um, and any examples in any cities that um, you would be interested in seeing here in Omaha? Yeah, you know, I thought it would be it would be interesting um, to go back into history a little bit and and to uh, to to and and by history I mean into the uh, development of 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 a hundred years ago, and that is the work of Clarence Stein and. Uh, for, for those of you who are planners, you, you may recognize that name. Stein was the designer of Radburn, but um, but the uh, but but uh, but they the, the the people of that period were dealing with exactly the same problems that we've discussed of of um, of missing middle housing, and so uh, so I thought it'd be interesting to show you. Uh, a couple of um, of of Stein, a couple of examples of Stein's work, and uh, and 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 it'll it'll show how things that that generally many of us sort of try have tried to get around, like cul-de-sacs, actually originated from that, but originated from the the desire to um, to build for families, to build for those demographics that I was talking about earlier. So I'm going to um, show you a couple of things from um, a, um, I'm going to attempt to find where, where the, uh, one, one thing of, of going to, um, going to a presentation from, um, is is that you lose the uh, screen sharing? There it is. Let's see if I, it will show up on the right screen that I want you to see. Yeah, we can what? see the community for the auto age. Okay, and is that that's all you're seeing? You're not seeing the rest of my desktop. Mm. I'm, yeah, we see a little bit in the background, um, but it, oh, I don't like want I, I don't want you to mode. no. That's yeah, that's what I don't want to show. Not that there's anything wrong with it, but it's yeah, you my, can just uh, expand it and we'll see the full. Yep. Yeah. I'm going to stop because I want you to see a different screen. Sure. Which is, yeah, one of the minor problems with having three screens is that uh, you don't know which one it's going to come up on. That looks perfect. Okay, now you're seeing, okay, great. Um, excellent. So I'm going to go back here a bit. This was, um, this was actually from um, a symposium presentation that I did a couple of months ago on uh, comparing the work of Stein and Moshe Safdi in terms of, of, of urban work. But uh, Stein um, and, and his uh, colleagues were dealing specifically with the issue of what we now call missing middle housing. And that is uh, in the 1920s, how do you build affordable housing for families? So uh, these guys included a developer, uh, uh, some urbanologists uh, like Lewis Mumford, uh, Benton McKay, who was the originator of the Appalachian Trail, um, Henry Wright and Clarence Stein, who were architects. Uh, Bing was the developer, and together they formed something called the City Housing Corporation, because they thought that the answer to was was partially design and partially finance. From a financing point of view, having limited profit corporations. So, so these were civic developers who said government programs didn't really exist at the time. So they said, we, um, we, we will um, uh, form a company that, that, that will build innovative development and will accept a limited profit in exchange for, for providing units at rent or prices that are, that are affordable. So the first project that they did that was completely, this is in New York City now. So, 
So this is a replacement, not necessarily for single family housing, but for tenements for, 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 for super high density housing, the Sunnyside Village uh, built on the site of an abandoned railroad yard in, in, in Queens. And, and so their idea was to build super blocks, which are anathema to new urbanists, but you can, you can see how things sort of flip around with hierarchies of space. So, so private open space, and then large areas for the kids to play in for, for, for common of, of, of common open space. And these are the ideas where what we think of as the contemporary PUD came from uh, or, or originally. So this is uh, Sunnyside Gardens as it was developed, um, uh, very similar to what we would now define as missing middle housing development, uh, townhome type densities. Uh, this is what it looks like today. And, and so 100 years for, uh, from the time that it, approximately 100 years from the time that it was built, it's still really um, a beautiful environment. Um, Radburn was an attempt to try to take these ideas into a single family setting and invented the cul-de-sac. So again, the idea here was that you develop houses on small lots around a cul-de-sac with common open space behind. And uh, uh, Radburn ran into the Great Depression. So it was designed as a new community of, of about 6,000 people, but only one cluster of housing was built. But you can see how the, how the concept was, um, was developed. Um, and, and to this day, it's one of the most beautiful housing environments I've ever seen. Um, I was there a few years ago and, um, and, and it's just, this is a Google picture because my finding my actual original slides would have been involved hours of work through sorting through, through slides, but, um, but, it, but, it's, but it's an incredibly beautiful uh, area. Uh, then it graduated to Greenbelt development, but the, um, the example that I really wanted to show you was Baldwin Hills Village, which is in Los Angeles, which um, which I, I kind of stumbled upon, built in um, in, um, in 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 nineteen forty or so. So this is uh, the site. It's now called Village Green. So um, I I stumbled on it on uh, a visit to Los Angeles where my kids live a year ago, um, looking at Google. Uh, Earth to find a, a, a nice, interesting bike route to to uh, to travel on, and saw something that really piqued my interest, and that is this different-looking project in the middle of of um, of uh, middle-century LA development. Then found out, drove by it on on the way to the LA Sci the California Science Center uh, with my grandchildren saw that it was a National Historic Landmark, Googled it and found out that this was in fact a very famous development, Baldwin Hills Village. So there it is, it's townhouses, again, with common, um, with common open space. And um, both from LA uh, perspective, an affordable environment and designed again, specifically for, for families with a hierarchy of private spaces and continues to be, um, a, a really beautiful site and, um, and, and beautiful development. Um, Stein uh, wrote a book called Four New Towns for America that, that uh, if, if people are not aware of it, might find very interesting. It's, it was written um, 70 years ago, it's, uh, it, copyright 1950 or so, but still available through, uh, through Amazon. And, um, and it's a review of all of these projects. It's a rather critical review, including critical of, of, uh, of his own projects. And of Baldwin Hills, he said he wished that they had expanded the private open space and, and, and uh, encroached a little bit on the public open space because of the uh, popularity of the private open spaces from a 1950 perspective. But Baldwin Hills Village with, um, with all of this um, uh, development, I'm gonna stop sharing now, what it was, uh, was about 10 units per acre. So it's, it's within what we would think as, as missing middle in contemporary 
parlance, um, but, uh, but, but an incredibly beautiful environment. They fought zoning, but what, what they fought was, um, was the urban grid, ironically, of the city wanting to put streets through the middle of it, or uh, which, which, you know, again, fashions and, and, and perspectives change. Um, so, so I think that, um, that flexibility, that, that now getting to your specific question, and I, and I apologize for that sort of digression, um, but it's interesting to see what people did struggling with the same problem 100 years ago. And here the, it was, it was a, a, a combination of innovative development design and a limited profit corporation that diversified the risk and reduced the, 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 um, the expectation of return in return for doing something good for society um, that, um, that, uh, that how people dealt with this problem a hundred years ago and, and, and how some of those um, features are still relevant to our contemporary period. But the idea of flexible development of, 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 uh, of the of project specific design um, are, are, are all, uh, interesting things and 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 have um, have have real uh, 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 utilization now, um, but but again I think that one of the chief uh, obstacles that we face and one of the chief ways that we should uh, uh, approach current policy is really risk abatement. It's um, it's it's. Um, it, it, uh, so, so from a private side, it's 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 things like um, uh, construct community-based construction financing that that reduces the risk for for a small builder. Um, TIF helps to abate risk because uh, because but because it's a gap filling element. Um, in redevelopment areas, it was a very interesting um, proposal that. Uh, that I was hoping had got would get included in either the Build Back Better or the infrastructure bills uh, that treats the gap between the ambient values in a specific area and the actual cost of construction for owner occupied housing in the same way that that gap is dealt with through tax credits for for, uh, for renter occupied housing. Again, we're we're kind of looking at this not just from the perspective of of the physical construct, but also the looking at missing middle and from an economic perspective of of um, of, of of missing uh, servicing and serving that part of the um, of of the um, urban family market. Uh, so we are uh, about to be beginning, uh, as some of you may know, an affordable housing plan for the city, and uh, and will undoubtedly be delving into some of these um, risk abatement measures for, for Omaha. I, I didn't mean to take you off into Marty land here particularly, no, that, but hopefully you'll be tolerant of that. That was great. And those examples um, were, yeah, really unique and um, really beautiful. Um, so, you know, something that we talk about in Missing Middle, and I, I think you, you touched on this. So um, we can reiterate, but this is one of the questions um, that I wanted to ask. Uh, some, something that we think about quite a bit is um, how to support the smaller up, up and coming developer um, who doesn't necessarily have the finances to yeah. design a large um, you know, project, but is more doing kind of lot by lot sections. I think um, you know, that's kind of the, the classic area where nimbyism can occur when you're just looking at um, maybe upzoning one lot. Um, so I, I really loved that idea of uh, community-based construction financing. Um, could you say more about it? Any thoughts on, on how to help and support yeah. uh, the small developer? Into yeah, I mean, we in, we in Omaha have been doing that for a number of years with, um, with community development corporations, with, with nonprofit corporations. Um, it hasn't been done to any great degree with for-profit developers or, or, or builders. And, 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 you're, and, and we should. So you're right in the, the, the problem 
that a small builder faces, and this is, this is a problem in urban neighborhoods and it's a problem in small towns too, of, uh, of uh, not being able to achieve any kind of economy of scale because uh, they uh, don't have the, the, the wherewithal or the willingness to basically mortgage their families uh, to, to be able to support speculatively built houses. And uh, for a small builder, that becomes a real problem because if you're building uh, in a one-off setting, you're only building one house at a time, you're really not achieving any sort of economy uh, uh, to, um, to, to reduce your costs somewhat. So, so those, uh, the, the idea of, ex of, of reducing that front end exposure uh, and, and doing it through a lender's consortium or some other kind of community-based financing uh, entity can be a very powerful thing in terms of providing an incentive for uh, young builders, new builders, small builders, to be able to um, to to um, not necessarily scale <clears throat> scale up to big projects, but to uh, but but to do relatively small projects that are that are in, uh, an infill setting. The other project that's been done in the Omaha area that I find um, very interesting and and have been using it as a model uh, in a lot of places that uh, we've been talking about uh, is the. Um, the, the 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 project that Perry Spirit Lake that uh, that Urban Village did that are small uh, small multifamily um, units. We we've gotten into this uh, mode where we're we're building 200, 250, 300 foot long, four or five story buildings um, that are very large projects and in, involve very big financing. Um, the um, the uh, downside of those, in addition to scale, is that they take a lot of money to build. Uh, in the 1950s and 1960s, uh, a lot of multifamily development was in much smaller sort of chunks that were more accessible to small builders. And in a COVID era, really uh, do a little bit better job of relating to uh, the desire to move away from double loaded corridors or or extensive publics uh, or, uh, or or common spaces. So so that project, which is entirely small buildings, um, is a big project, but but it also reflects uh, an era that I think is relevant again. Where, where multifamily can be built in smaller chunks, in smaller buildings, with smaller, with smaller footprints by smaller developers. So, um, so, so those are, 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 are some approaches that, uh, that I think relate to, to, to that very important objective of, of diverse, diversifying the market and providing opportunities for smaller builders. Yeah, that's really um, interesting. We're getting some um, questions in the chat about this concept of um, what it means to have affordable housing in Omaha and um, what uh, uh, how we determine what that cost is. Um, when I've read, uh, you know, um, studies about what's considered affordable, what I've come across, and I'm interested in hearing what um, you define mm -hmm. that as, Marty, is 30% um, uh, of a household's income going towards housing. So whatever that median income rate is in Omaha, taking 30% of that. Um, how, how do you define affordability? Well, uh, remember that affordability is, is, uh, is a sliding scale. So if you're, if you're really rich, a million dollars is affordable. Um, in Los Angeles, uh, 1.5 million dollars is affordable. I mean, that is that 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 is an affordable unit. Anything in in six figures is, even if it's high six figures, is affordable housing. So uh, my kids uh, op occasionally open Zillow and 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 look at what 400 thousand dollars buys in Omaha and just say. Are you kidding? That that wouldn't even buy a garage in Los Angeles. So, so you know, we it it, it is a it, it is a, a, a it is a, a 
a variable thing depending upon the context. So yes, 30% of adjusted gross income is the standard um, number for, for housing affordability. And so if we look at, at uh, that in terms of Omaha's uh, median family income, which, which I don't have right at my fingertips right, right now, but let's say that's $60,000, which is probably, probably pretty close, um, that uh, if that's the, the median AGI, then that uh, translates to, um, to 60,000 divided by 12 is $5,000, take 30% of that, um, uh, well, $5,000 per month, take 30% of that, and that's $1,500 a month for housing costs. Um, so, so whether people would think that in a rental setting, $1,500 a month was affordable, it, 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 it is, um, I guess, but, uh, but, but it isn't depending upon your other fixed costs. So, so a family that's got um, uh, medical bills, school bills, um, other, other costs related to raising children and an empty nester, $1,500 a month for housing has two totally different, um, uh, different perspectives. $1,500 a month will buy you at current interest rates uh, a, a house that's in the range of $200 to $225,000 to stay within that, uh, that, that framework. Incidentally, by the way, um, the, 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 the most gigantic housing subsidy that, that we have available right now at this point of time is low interest rates. Um, I mean, I, when, when uh, we try to do some of the first major ownership redevelopment units in North Omaha in the early 1980s, and interest rates were around 18%. If you, if you can imagine that yeah. uh, right now, a 7% rate would be considered exorbitant and would mm -hmm. kill the housing market. We used to subsidize mortgages down to 7% or 6% to, uh, mm -hmm. to be affordable. So again, it's a relative thing. Um, but, but that's a reasonable, I mean, that is a reasonable standard. Uh, in Minneapolis, uh, the, the set aside for, um, affordable rental housing goes up to 1900 affordable rental housing on a set aside basis in in their in, in their program can go up to $1900 for a, a month for a two bedroom unit mm. so uh, you know again it's 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 a relative thing and relatively speaking omaha's housing costs are relatively low even though they're they're increasing Sure, compared to the national standard, and I appreciate but, the nuance. But the problem is that it's not cheaper to build housing here. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, getting a lot of uh, questions in the um, chat about um, the concept of TIF being a way to provide more affordable housing in Omaha, um, seeing perhaps a trend that um, developers applying for TIF uh, sometimes have a few affordable units, maybe not more than they're replacing, but sometimes get approved having none. Um, what are your thoughts about TIF as a mechanism for providing affordability? And um, I'm also really interested in the idea of um, uh, like accountability around TIF and um, yeah. like following up and seeing if those dollars were used appropriately. Well, it's an, it's an, it's an interesting problem because you know, the original intention of TIF was to promote reinvestment in, quote, blighted, unquote, areas. And uh, if you think about TIF in the 1980s, when there was no multifamily housing or housing of any type being built in established neighborhoods, um, and that, uh, that we would tend to be pretty tolerant of anything that people would build to reinvest in in, in, in neighborhoods so, so there so there's a level of income integration that needed to be needed to be promoted and and investment promoted as well so now we're in a very different period of time in in 2022 and and value in established neighborhoods is a little bit more secure and we might now be experiencing the um, uh, 
the, the ability, increasingly the ability to, to require some sort of quid pro quo, namely providing affordable housing in projects of a certain scale that are, that are, that receive TIF incentives. So I believe that thinking about uh, uh, a requirement or, or, or a set aside of affordable units in TIF assisted projects is something that really ought to be, ought to be looked at. Uh, at least in in areas that have established housing values, where um, where where um, we're trying to promote affordability and not necessarily just redevelopment or re or, or reinvestment, um, accountability for uh, for TIF. Uh, I I I don't know exactly what's being done right now on. From, from the city point of view, we'll learn a lot more about how it's being administered as we get into the affordable housing plan, I'm sure. Um, but um, it's the, the, the uh, I, I think the, the, the record keeping or follow up on, on, on the use of TIF, if there is an affordability set aside required uh, is an issue to be discussed because uh, uh, it, it's the the procedures for it are are established uh, by the federal government in terms of the use of LIHTC or low income housing tax credits. Um, they're not very well established, I don't think, in terms of of city use of TIF because they haven't been it hasn't been used that way. Um, so so I think I I I. I, I know that the projects that have used TIF so far have been tax credit projects for the most part. Um, as a result of that, we, you, you know that some of the units are going to be um, retained as low uh, in low income occupancy because of the penalty of, of, uh, of, um, of reclamation of the tax credits, of, of, of returning a lot of money if those rules are violated. Um, on projects that are not specifically federal tax credit projects, um, there'll have to be procedures established to 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 follow up to assure that um, units remain that the required set aside of units remains uh, affordable. And I think uh, the Minneapolis um, uh, example that uh, that is requiring or trying to require that set aside in, in any multifamily units over 50 units will be interesting to see what they do and see what and learn from what their um, experience is going to be. Really interesting. And you see that as a direct outcome of the affordable housing project? Well, it's, some, or... it's, something to, it's something to look at. Sure. You, you know, and it, that... Uh, and and it has to be very carefully balanced because the projects still have to work economically. Right. So uh, so the, the 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 tax credit projects um, have a significant uh, benefit to investors that accrues to investors because of the the investment tax credit. Um, projects that are uh, locally financed and don't involve federal tax credits. Are going to involve some reduction of re presumably, if the units are indistinguishable, some reduction of return to the um, to the developer. So the thing's still got to work economically, and and that involves, uh, I think, a certain level of sophistication on the part of the city too, in terms of investment analysis of of the um, of of the. Uh, pro forma that's being shown. So, so there's always there's there's always been this joke about there are three three pro formas that are developed. One one is for the city, one is for the bank, and one is the real one. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's, that's this really gets a little bit into Donald Trump's real estate. Practice, <laughs> <I think. laughs> Um, well, I know, you know, we're running low on time. I, I think I could uh, ask you questions all night. Um, 
and uh, wanted to end uh, at Missing Middle um, and nationally, I think we're having a conversation about the concept of accessory dwelling unit, accessory dwelling units, uh, granny flats or mother-in-law suites. Uh -huh. um, wanted to get your insight on how the zoning code in place today kind of came to be that um, limits the you know construction of these and, and several areas and um, kind of um, what you see as ADU's role in the housing market in the future in our country. Well, interestingly, in when when I wrote or or we wrote the I, I wrote it mostly the 1987 zoning ordinance, uh, it did include ADUs. It, so we defined we didn't call them ADUs at the time. We called them two family. Uh, we called it two family housing, and and they were permitted in a number of zoning districts. So. Um, Nobody took us up on that because it was considered the idea of um, of building uh, two structures on one residential lot was uh, was uh, was 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 a practice that was considered retrograde and 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 bad, and and we actually did introduce that into the in into the code, and nobody used it. I mean, it just wasn't what was what was done. Um, I am a fan of ADUs. Uh, and, and, and I think they have, um, they have real benefits and, and, and the ability to do that with certain standards for setback and separation from buildings and, and lot size to some degree um, should should be there. Um, it doesn't mean that they're automatically going to be built. It, it just means that the permission is, um, is, is, is granted. But I think that uh, they are a way of potentially making housing more affordable. Um, another area that I, that I think has a lot of interesting appeal that isn't necessarily used all that much are owner-occupied duplexes, uh, by, by which um, uh, a, a person can get a mortgage, uh, build a two unit or buy a two unit attached building, live in one side and use the income from the other side to uh, help pay the mortgage off. So uh, we, we saw a, a lot of this in work that we've been doing in the Dubuque metropolitan area of all places that, that where, where single family lots and new subdivisions are actually being converted to owner occupied duplexes. So, um, so, so, uh, now these are, uh, are 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 lots that are established at the outset before people move in and before there's um, there there are um, uh, NIMBYs who oppose that. Um, but we also had included uh, provisions in the in the original eighty seven ordinance, and I assume they're still there that uh, that 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 were treating zero lot line or basically attached units. Uh, the same way as single family units, as long as the densities were the same. So, so, you know, as early as the late 1980s, we were trying to introduce these kinds of, of, of um, innovations into what was a, a very outdated code. Um, they weren't being used particularly at that time because nobody was just was was doing that. But the precedents there. Yeah. That's a really interesting history. I appreciate that. Well, it's um, 632. We've taken an hour of your evening and, and really appreciate all of the um, knowledge and, and sources that you've um, provided us tonight. Um, I'll put in the chat for folks interested in um, getting on our list of events for Missing Middle. Um, you can subscribe to our newsletter. Um, I also started the recording a little bit late, um, but per, for folks who were um, registered, that will be available and really appreciate your time and um, knowledge tonight, uh, Marty. Thank you very much. Um, thanks. Well, thanks everyone for being on board. All right. Have a good night, thanks. everyone. Thanks.